The show centers around Anne Boonchui, a 13-year-old girl who finds herself unexpectedly transported to the whimsical world of Amphibia, along with her loyal companions, Sasha Waybright and Marcy Wu. Amphibia is a vibrant and marshy land inhabited by talking frogs and other interesting creatures. Together, the trio embarks on exciting and sometimes perilous adventures, navigating this new world while also learning valuable lessons about friendship, courage, and the importance of embracing one's true self. Timeline Before 7980 BCE In the vast multiverse, there is this powerful being called the Guardian. He has the job of watching over tons of worlds and stuff. But here's the interesting part. The Guardian decided to create these Calamity Gems to see how we mortals would handle having unlimited power. The whole point of this little experiment was to find someone worthy of taking over the Guardian's gig, so he himself could retire and sip cosmic smoothies, or something. Now these Calamity Gems each represent a different trait. We got the Green Gem of Wit, which looks for smart peeps who also stay humble. Then there's the red gem for strength, seeking those with muscles and determination. And lastly, the blue gem for heart, searching for folks who've got empathy and a strong sense of responsibility. The hardest thing. 1019 CE or before. The gems are sent to the mortal realm of Amphibia, and a wise newt named Valeriana creates something called the Calamity Box, which harnesses the power of these gems. Valeriana had a grand plan to bring all the kingdoms together and create peace in their homeland, Amphibia. But King Aldrich and his ancestors got their hands on the Calamity Box and started using it for their own not-so-noble purposes. They traveled to other worlds, wanting to conquer and exploit them for resources. Eventually, Amphibia becomes a high-tech world after invading worlds and stealing technology. They even create this hive mind called the Core that contains the collective consciousness of all their previous leaders. Aldrich was the commander of the military in Amphibia and had a son named Andreas. One day, Aldrich takes Andreas to the royal basement and spills the beans about the Core. Aldrich then hands him the key to the Calamity Box and tells Andreas that his main mission is to invade Earth and start mining the planet for its resources. So, Andreas is like, hey, Leaf and Barrel, check out this cool musical box I got. They gather around, all excited to see what it can do. But when Leif touches the stones, he sees a horrifying vision of Amphibia getting totally wrecked. He suggests to Andreas that maybe they shouldn't use the music box to invade more worlds. It's a reasonable suggestion, right? So they go to Aldrich to discuss their concerns. But Aldrich accuses Andreas' friends of wanting to abuse his power and calls them traitors. Leif tries her best to convince Andreas to reconsider, but Andreas stubbornly refuses to go against Aldrich. They argue about it, but eventually they make up, and things seem to get back on track. However, things take a twist when Andreas realizes that the key to the music box is missing. He quickly figures out that Leif has taken it and is on her way to Mother Olm. Andreas and Beryl give chase to Leaf, determined to capture her and retrieve the music box. However, Beryl allows her to escape. This act of betrayal leads to Beryl's explosion from Newtopia, and he is reassigned to the outskirts as a result of his failure to fulfill his duty. Tragically, Beryl meets his untimely demise while valiantly defending a village from a menacing beast. With the music box no longer an amphibia, Aldrich is not too pleased with his son's failure. But then, the core reveals that the music box will return to Amphibia in a thousand years. Now Aldrich decides that the royalty will lie in wait until the right time comes when the music box is back in Amphibia. Leaf, determined to prevent the catastrophic vision she witnessed, used the power of the music box to teleport to Earth, leaving the box behind to avoid the dark fate she foresaw. After her time on Earth, Leaf eventually returned to Amphibia and embraced a new life with a brand new identity that went by the name Lily Planter. She became a founding member of Warthog Swamp, where she met and married a farmer. Together they raised a family and witnessed their children grow up over the years. Before her passing, Leaf penned a heartfelt letter addressed to Andreas, expressing her hopes that he would one day read it. 1951
Hopadiah Hop-Pop Planter, born in 1951, was part of the Planter family. Growing up in Warthog Swamp, Hop-Pop had some wild adventures all over Amphibia. One time, he went to an auction and ended up rescuing a snail named Bessie from a shady figure named Jim Snipes. They became best buddies after that. Another time, Hop-Pop and Bessie got stuck in a snowy wilderness. It was looking really bleak, but then Bessie started singing, and it gave Hop-Pop the strength to keep going. At some point, Hop-Pop decided to follow in the footsteps of his family and become a farmer, taking over the planter's stand from his father. He also started his own family and had a son. However, somewhere between 2014 and 2017, tragedy struck when two herons attacked Wartwood, resulting in the loss of Hop Pop's son and daughter-in-law. Luckily, Sprig and Polly, Hop Pop's grandchildren who were born in 2008 and 2014 respectively, managed to survive by hiding. Since then, Hop Pop has taken on the responsibility of caring for and protecting Sprig and Polly, becoming quite overprotective of them prior 2000s. Before the 2000s, Mr. and Mrs. Boonchoy met and later ended up getting married. 2006. The two had a daughter named Anne Boonchoy in the year 2006. Sasha Waybright and Marcy Wu are also born in the same year. 2010. On a sunny day at the beach, fate brought Anne and Marcy together and formed an instant bond. A few years later, while playing at a nearby playground, they encountered Sasha, a fierce defender against bullies. Impressed by her bravery, Anne and Marcy welcomed Sasha into their circle of friendship with open arms. From that day forward, the trio became an unstoppable team, embarking on countless adventures and creating memories that would last a lifetime. During her journey, Anne found a stray cat and decided to adopt her, naming her Domino. Season 1 Alright, Whew! We're finally here! Let's begin! 2019. The year is 2019. Anne is about to turn 13 and her parents are preparing a birthday party. Meanwhile, Marcy comes across a book about the Calamity Box and its powers. Then, Marcy gets some big news. Her family's moving to Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Worried about leaving her friends behind, she decides to run away. And guess what? She stumbles upon a box just like the one in the book at the thrift shop. She snaps a pic and sends it to Sasha, claiming it's the perfect birthday gift for Anne. During their science class, Sasha persuades Anne to sneak out of school and celebrate her birthday. They head to a coffee shop, where Sasha manages to convince Anne to skip her own birthday party, causing her to be separated from her parents. It's during this time that they receive a message from Marcy about the box, and they eventually meet up with her at the thrift store. At the thrift store, Sasha convinces Anne to shoplift the box using her persuasive skills. After a few hours, the trio returns to the playground, and Anne opens the box with Sasha and Mercy, which unexpectedly transports them to the world of Amphibia. In Amphibia, the gang gets split up, and the box doesn't work anymore, so they are stuck here with no means to get back. Anne ends up in Wartwood, taking cover in a cozy cave. Wally mistakes Anne for a wild creature in the forest, triggering a town-wide hunt for her. But little did he know Anne is actually just a lost human girl. Thankfully, Sprig takes matters into his own hands and befriends Anne, convincing his family to bring her to the planter farm. It's the start of an unexpected and hilarious adventure. From here on out, most of the episodes revolve around Anne getting used to his new life in Amphibia. Sprig, being the kind-hearted frog he is, offers to be Anne's best friend in order to help her feel less homesick. They embark on a secret adventure to a nearby lake for a swim, enjoying the freedom and fun together. On the other side of the story, Captain Grime, suspicious about Sasha's actions, stumbles upon Anne's missing shoe and starts to question the truthfulness of his prisoner. Sometime later, Anne accidentally breaks the planter family cane while imitating Hop Pop. Determined to make things right, she teams up with Sprig and Polly to find a replacement. Despite their efforts, they are unable to find an exact match of the cane. However, Hop Pop shows understanding and compassion, telling Anne that she can stay with them as long as she treats him and the family respectfully. With the planter farm's basement flooded by river lampreys, Anne finds herself in need of a place to sleep. Sprig generously offers his room, 
and for 10 days, Anne stays there while they deal with the situation. Once the flooding subsides, Anne transitions to sleeping on the living room couch, making herself at home in the Planter household. Anne's integration into the Planter family seems to be going smoothly. She even takes on the challenge of cooking and enters a contest, aiming to win with her pizza. However, things take a hilarious turn when a carnivorous tomato plant devours all their ingredients. Determined to salvage the situation, they eat their way out of the plant's stomach and use tomatoes to create a new dish. Unfortunately, their creation turns out to be the worst dish in the entire contest, resulting in the Plantar family being placed in the cage of shame. Despite this setback, it's all a part of the fun and misadventures that Anne experiences in her newfound home. Anne stumbles upon this totally cute caterpillar that looks just like her cat Domino. She's instantly smitten and decides to keep it as her secret pet. The only catch? Hop Pop ain't exactly thrilled about having pets in the house. So Anne goes into covert mode, hiding her caterpillar buddy from the family. But things take a wild turn when the caterpillar turns into a raccoon and attacks the family. Anne steps up and saves the day, rescuing her family from the chaos. All right, check this out. Anne has been living and working in town for a while now, but the people still treat her like some kind of monster. It's not cool, right? But she's determined to change their minds and earn some respect. So when toad tax collectors roll into town, Anne gets an idea. She figures if she hangs out with these toads and helps them collect taxes, maybe people will see her as a badass protector. And let me tell you, she totally impresses those toad soldiers with her mad fighting skills. They even give her a badge and a sword. Now she's on a mission to collect taxes. But here's the twist. The toad's methods are, like, way too brutal for a 13-year-old. Things get intense when they target Hop Pop, but Anne stands up for him and claims he's already paid. It turns into a big brawl, but Sprig comes through and reveals that the mayor has been hoarding all the tax money in his statue. The people finally get their stuff back. The mayor is showered with veggies, and they start cheering for Anne, their official protector. She finally gets the respect she deserves. Sasha finds herself captured by Captain Grime and his Toad Army at the Toad Tower. However, she quickly proves her worth by saving the tower from a heron attack, earning Captain Grimes' trust and becoming his second in command. To make things even more interesting, they receive intel from Bog, Fens, and Meyer about Anne's presence in Wartwood. So now Sasha is on her way to find her best friend. The planters decide to visit the town archives to help Anne on her quest to get back home. But guess what? They end up just getting trapped inside because Sprig breaks the key classic sprig, am I right? They try everything to break down the door, but nothing works. Then, in a stroke of genius, Sprig remembers that the archives used to be a home, so they start looking for old bathrooms. Sprig manages to squeeze through the pipes and pop out of Felicia's tea shop. He rushes back and saves Anne just in the nick of time. Anne then explains to Sprig that she's not looking for adventure. She just wants to find a way home, even if it means doing stuff they might not like. Sprig feels bad and apologizes, but as they hug, they accidentally break the skylight, and they both fall through the ground. Don't worry, though, they land on a pile of books they had stacked up earlier. Alright, so here's the scoop. Against Hop Pop's warning, Anne and Sprig decide to check out the Bazaar Bazaar, this crazy market that only shows up once a year. While they're there, Anne's calamity box gets swiped, but they spot it as a prize in a cockroach cart race. They're determined to win it back, but they end up losing to this mysterious dude called Wrecker. Turns out, Wrecker is actually Hop Pop in disguise. He wanted to teach the kids a lesson about safety and listening to him. Anne and Sprig apologize for not heeding his advice, and Anne hands over the Calamity Box to Hop Pop for safekeeping. She makes him promise to find answers about it. But here's the kicker. Later that night, when everyone's snoozing, Hop Pop sneaks out and buries the Calamity Box outside. He claims it's the only way to keep it safe, totally going against Anne's promise. By the end of Season 1, Anne wins this big Frog of the Year award and gets to plan her own party. But the Frogs of Wartwood aren't exactly ready for a human-style bash. Chaos ensues and Anne gets pretty bummed out. 
But Hop Pop reminds her that the award wasn't about being perfect, but about growing as a person in her new community. So they all rally together, scavenging what's left of the party and having a blast in their own froggy way. And guess what? The love is in the air too. Ivy confesses to Sprig that she wants to go out with him, and he's all in. They hit the dance floor and have a grand old time. But wait, there's more! Anne gets a surprise visitor. It's Sasha, one of her best friends from back home, who also got transported to Amphibia. They scream with joy, hugging it out because they thought they'd never see each other again. But hold on tight, because Sasha brings along Captain Grime and his Toad army, and they emerge from the shadows. Grime greets Anne, saying, Nice to finally meet you, Anne Boonchui. The Toads gather around under the pretense of hosting a banquet to celebrate the reunion of Anne and Sasha. But here's the twist. It's all a wicked scheme to execute Hop Pop, who has been a symbol of rebellion in this valley. As he's about to be executed and fed to a giant Venus flytrap, Anne tries to convince Sasha to free them. But Grime proposes a duel between the girls. If Anne wins, the frogs can go free. If Sasha wins, Hop Pop meets his grim fate. Anne comes out on top, but Grime breaks his promise and is about to drop Hop Pop. Just when things seem dire, Wally's mushrooms start blowing up the tower, causing chaos. Meanwhile, Sasha tries to get up, but slips and falls off the side of the crumbling tower. Anne grabs her hand just in time, but Sasha realizes the weight of her actions and the danger she poses to them. In a heartbreaking decision, she lets go, believing that Anne might be better off without her. Sasha plummets towards the ground, but Grime appears and catches her midair, sliding down the side of the tower with his dagger. The tower stops crumbling, and Grime retreats into the woods with an unconscious Sasha, followed by the rest of the Toad Army. Season 2 Sometime in spring, the group plans a trip to Newtopia, now that the mountain range is clear and they can search for answers about getting Anne back home. Hop Pop entrusts their house and crops to Chuck, who is hired as their house and crop guard. But Chuck seems a bit incapable for the job, so Anne takes it upon herself to fortify the house. However, her attempt creates a gigantic veggie monster that ends up destroying their house. Just when things seem bleak, Anne's eyes start glowing blue, and she unleashes incredible strength, defeating the monster. It turns out Chuck isn't so incompetent after all. He reveals himself as a master builder and fixes their house in no time. With their house restored, they're ready to embark on their journey. But Anne asks Hop Pop if they can bring the music box along. Hop Pop, however, declines, claiming it's safe with his contracts. The planter family reaches Newtopia, all excited to explore the city. But oh no, the gates are closed due to a massive ant invasion. They quickly realize that they need to defeat the entire ant army before they can enter. Just when things seem dire, bags of oil are tossed their way, and a fire arrow ignites the oil, causing the barbarians to retreat. And who's the mysterious archer on top of the gates? It's Marcy! Anne recognizes her right away, and they have a tearful and joyous reunion, hugging it out like long-lost friends. Marcy leads Anne and the planters to the castle, where they meet King Andreas. The king inquires about the music box, but to their dismay, the planters don't have it with them. Luckily, Anne shows a photo of the box, and he notices that the gems in the photo are gray instead of their usual colors. Andreas reveals that the gems can be lit up in three different temples. To assist them, Marcy is tasked with conducting research in the archives. In the meantime, Andreas generously provides the planters with a gold credit card, allowing them to enjoy the luxuries of Newtopia. He arranges for their stay at a lavish hotel, ensuring their comfort during their time in the city. Some time passes, and the planters come to the decision that it's time to return home. As they spend their last moments together at the aquarium, Anne prepares to say her goodbyes. However, noticing Anne's sadness, Marcy suggests that she should go back with them and wait for her arrival. Upon returning to Wartwood, Anne receives a letter from Marcy, signaling that she's ready to embark on their temple mission together. Anne asks Hop Pop to retrieve the music box, only to discover that it's missing. Feeling betrayed, Anne storms out into the woods in frustration. Meanwhile, Sprig and Polly learn that Maggie Beetles have taken the box. 
They venture into dangerous territory and soon find themselves in trouble. Anne and Hop Pop rescue the young planters and retrieve the precious music box. With the box back in their hands, Anne initially wants to leave immediately. However, Hop Pop reveals the painful reason behind his actions, the loss of his son and daughter-in-law. Hearing this, Anne forgives him. Well, a little bit, and they return home. Marcy, Anne, and the planters embark on a journey to an ancient temple that presents them with an intelligence-based trial. To their surprise, Marcy effortlessly solves the puzzle, leading to the charging of the green gem, a significant step forward in their quest. During Anne and Marcy's journey to find a way home, they come across an icy mountain temple. There they encounter Valeriana, who challenges them to a test of trust and patience. Unfortunately, Anne fails the test, leading Valeriana to believe they are unworthy of the stones they seek. Determined to prove herself, Anne risks her own life to save Valeriana from falling off a cliff. To their surprise, Valeriana reveals that the mountain climb was actually a trial, and Anne has successfully passed it. Two down, one more to go. Meanwhile, Sasha and Grime go on a quest to retrieve a legendary warhammer in order to seek aid in their plan of taking over Newtopia. After a long journey, Anne, Marcy, and the planters reach the third volcanic temple. To their surprise, they find Sasha and Grime waiting for them, claiming to have changed and learned from their past mistakes. United, they face off against a gigantic monster and manage to defeat it, successfully charging the last gem of the box. However, Grime reminds Sasha to stay focused on their original plan. While Sasha is now torn between her loyalty to Grime and her friendship with Anne, Despite the conflicting emotions, the Calamity Box is now fully charged and ready for its ultimate purpose. Alright, so things are going to get really exciting from here on out. The gang arrives in Newtopia to bid their farewells and send the three girls home. King Andreas greets them with joy, acknowledging their success in obtaining the Calamity Box. However, just as Anne is about to hand over the box, Sasha and Grime seize the opportunity and steal it. Chaos ensues and Grime manages to overpower Andreas using the warhammer they acquired earlier. Anne, consumed with anger and betrayal, refuses to reconcile with Sasha and harshly ends their friendship. Marcy attempts to mediate and find a peaceful resolution, but her efforts prove futile. In a daring move, Anne frees Andreas, who utilizes the box's power to lift his castle into the sky, revealing his sinister intentions of conquering Earth. Oh, and guess what? Marcy already knew his intentions and kept them hidden. We have not one, but two traitors here. Anyways, Andreas seemingly kills Sprig during the chaos, and even though he is rescued by Marcy, Anne doesn't know that and awakens her calamity powers. She kicks some ass for a while until her powers run out, and in a dire moment, Marcy sends her and the planters back to Earth. However, as they leave, Marcy gets stabbed in the heart by Andreas. I told you things will get exciting here. Season 3 Back in the bustling streets of Los Angeles, Anne is reunited with her parents and her beloved cat, Domino. Overwhelmed with emotions, she shares the exciting tales of her adventures in Amphibia, carefully omitting the impending invasion of Earth and the betrayals she has experienced. Her parents listen in awe, trying to make sense of the talking frogs before them. With a renewed determination, Anne vows to find a way back to Amphibia to save Marcy and confront Sasha. Little do they know, in Amphibia, King Andreas is preparing for the invasion and has ordered a powerful Frobot to eliminate Anne. The Frobot attacks, but Anne taps into her powers once again, dealing a significant blow to the mechanical foe. However, Frobot repairs itself and becomes even more determined to destroy Anne. Back in the world of Amphibia, Marcy miraculously survives her injuries, but remains in critical condition. King Andreas orders Lady Olivia and General Yunnan to transport her to a rejuvenation tank for treatment. Meanwhile, Sasha and Grime, still hiding from the giant newt, seek refuge in Wartwood. They arrive at the planter's farm, and Sasha enters Anne's room and discovers her friend's journal. As she reads through its pages, Sasha is moved to tears as she realizes the genuine value Anne placed on their friendship. Filled with remorse and a newfound determination, Sasha decides to make things right. 
However, a colossal metal behemoth is sent to annihilate Sasha, Grime, and the entire town of Wartwood. With the help of the courageous villagers, they manage to defeat the formidable enemy and secure a hard-fought victory. And powered by her newfound confidence, Sasha takes on the role of a leader, rallying the citizens of Wartwood to join her in a rebellion against King Andreas. Back at home, Anne decides to tell her parents the truth about her adventures in Amphibia while the Frobot is set to a one-hour self-destruct timer by Andreas, who orders it to locate and kill Anne. As the Frobot's self-destruction timer ticks down, Anne and the gang find themselves cornered in the junkyard. In a moment of desperation, Anne taps into her hidden powers and unleashes a display of incredible strength, launching the Frobot into space and saving her family from the imminent explosion. However, their actions do not go unnoticed, and the event is captured on camera by the FBI. The episode Mr. X features RuPaul as an FBI officer who locates the planters in a movie theater and aims to capture them. However, the gang escapes with the help of Anne's parents, leaving Mr. X to be laughed at by the other FBI agents. Back in Amphibia, Olivia and Yunen try to rescue Marcy, but are ultimately confronted by Andreas, who reveals his true intentions about her. He then plugs the core into Marcy, allowing it to take over her body. This evil version of Marcy is now called Darcy. With the help of Terry, the gang manages to construct a portal that will take them back to Amphibia. However, their plans are interrupted when the FBI arrives and kidnap the planter family. Anne, determined to rescue her friends, gathers her allies and stages a daring rescue mission. They narrowly evade the FBI and make their way through the portal, arriving in Amphibia. To their horror, they discover that Amphibia has been ravaged and devastated by King Andreas. With the gang back in Amphibia, they reunite with the Wartwood Resistance. Recognizing Anne's strength and courage, they unanimously appoint her as their leader. Some time later, the crew meets with Mother Olm, the keeper of ancient prophecies. After some weird shenanigans, this is what she recites to them. Three stars, burning bright, come from beyond to expel the night. Should they fight or embrace the fall, their choice will determine the fate of all. With death looming above their heads, Anne and Sasha convince the frogs, newts, and toads to work together. Sprig also finds a blank letter that Lily Planter left centuries ago for Andreas. The Resistance launches an all-out attack on Newtopia, and before you know it, Anne and Sasha find themselves in the grasp of the Calamity Box. However, they get captured by Darcy, who intends to kill Anne. Anne lies that killing her would extinguish the power of the box altogether, which causes Darcy to spare her. The episode ends with Andrea's fleet arriving in Los Angeles to conquer the world. Anne, Sasha, and the planters make their way back to Earth and reunite with Anne's parents, who have become agents working with Mr. X. The gang splits up into two teams, with one going after the castle, while the other defends against the army. Anne's parents find themselves facing off against a heron that reminds Hop Pop of Sprig and Polly's past tragedy. But they manage to tame the heron, turning it against Andreas and his forces. Meanwhile, inside the castle, Sasha and Grime go all out against Darcy. Things get intense when Grime sacrifices his arms to save Sasha's life, leaving her furious and launching a powerful counterattack. During the epic showdown in Los Angeles, Anne and Andreas go head-to-head, -head, capturing the attention and support of the entire city. The crowd cheers Anne on as she pushes Andreas to the edge of defeat, but her powers eventually drain, leaving her completely exhausted. In a touching moment, Sprig reads a heartfelt letter from Lily to Andreas, revealing that, despite their separation and new life in Wartwood, she still loved him and hoped he would find peace. Andreas is moved to tears, realizing that Lily still cared for him, despite everything. As Anne emerges victorious, it's revealed that Andreas had used cybernetics to prolong his life. And on the other side, Sasha manages to free Marcy by severing her connection with the Core. With victory in their hands, the castle is teleported back to Amphibia, marking a significant turning point in the battle. As the Core reveals itself and sets the moon in motion towards the castle, 
Mother Ulm appears and recognizes the fulfillment of the prophecy, with Anne, Sasha, and Marcy emerging as the saviors of the world. The trio seeks out Valeriana, who has been waiting for their arrival. They join forces and activate the power of the stones within their hearts, donning their empowered armor to confront the core. Even Andreas undergoes a change of heart and directs his forces to halt the advancing moon. However, Sasha and Marcy struggle to control their newfound powers, prompting Anne to ask for their gems and combine their collective strength. With her divine abilities, she effortlessly destroys the moon, but the immense power takes a toll on her mortal body, leading to her eventual demise. Anne wakes up in front of the Guardian, who reveals that she is the first human in 10,000 years to have used the stone for good. The Guardian offers her an opportunity to become the next Guardian, but she declines, choosing to live her human life instead. The Guardian strikes a deal with her, allowing her to become the next Guardian after her mortal life ends. Anne returns to the mortal realm and bids farewell to Amphibia, leaving the mystical world behind. Months later, Amphibia has been rebuilt and restored, with Andreas having abducted his throne and now working to heal the environment he once devastated. Polly has completed her transformation into a fully developed frog, and Grime, Olivia, and Yunin have taken on important roles in their respective communities. Hop Pop has started a successful business selling California avocados, with Frobo assisting him on the planter farm. Sprig diligently keeps a journal of the creatures he encounters, using Anne's phone to capture their images. Wartwood pays tribute to Anne by erecting a statue in her honor. Inspired by Anne's courage, Sprig and Ivy set off to explore a new, untouched continent with the hope of new adventure and discoveries. Some time later, Marcy receives the necessary medical attention for her injuries and undergoes psychotherapy to address any lingering psychological issues. She also spends quality time with Anne and Sasha, strengthening their bond through shared interests. Eventually, Marcy and her parents relocate to Hopkinton. Anne, Sasha, and Marcy make efforts to stay connected, frequently keeping in touch and visiting each other whenever possible. In the year 2029, Anne secures a job at the Aquarium of the Pacific, specifically working in the frog section. She takes the opportunity to pay homage to Amphibia and its inheritance with her role. Sasha, on the other hand, pursues a career as a children's psychologist, and Marcy discovers her passion for writing webcomics. Although they lead separate lives, Anne, Sasha, and Marcy continue to cherish their friendship and come together to celebrate special occasions, like Anne's 23rd birthday. As time goes on, they each make their own unique contributions to the world. In the year 1998, at the age of 91, Anne passes away, fulfilling her destiny as the next Guardian who watches over the Earth. So, that will be it from us. If you enjoyed the video, then leave us a like and subscribe to our channel for similar content. Thanks for watching. We'll see you at the next one.